Hi, everybody, and welcome. Hope the uh, hope these sessions have been helpful for you. We're thrilled to have you here. Um, we only have 45 minutes, I guess, so we're going to move relatively briskly because there's a lot happening in the education space. So uh, I'm Alan Carroll. I founded the Story Maps effort at Esri and had an editorial team uh, that includes my, my uh, colleagues, Ross and Lara. You want to introduce yourselves briefly? Hi, everyone. I'm Ross Donahue. I've been with Esri for about three years. Um, love working with educators like yourself and excited to share uh, the great uh, updates. Over to you, Lara. Hi, everyone. I'm Lara Winnegar. I am relatively new to the Story Maps team, and I love K-12 education, and I'm hoping that we can make some big improvements in this space in the next, well, in the future. So over to you, Alan. Great. Laura's all already off to a good start, and you'll see a little bit of her work uh, later in our program. <clears throat> so I think most of you probably know what story maps are. So again, I'm going to spin through this pretty quickly, just in case, uh, to just give you the basics. So story maps uh, work on the web, of course, and they combine interactive maps hosted on Esri's cloud service, ArcGIS Online, and, uh, and non-interactive maps, by the way with multimedia content, so photos, videos, audio, and text to tell stories about the world, all sorts of stories about the world on all sorts of topics meant for all sorts of different audiences, grade levels, etc. <clears throat> they work on a variety of screen sizes, so in other words, they're responsive. We work really hard to make sure they work beautifully on mobile devices and tablets as well as PCs. And to me, this is the real secret of story map success. They incorporate interactive builders, so you don't need to have any technical knowledge other than just a basic sense of how things work on the web to put together a beautiful story. Um, and the, the heart of our builder function is what we call the uh, uh, block palette, uh, where you can, uh, you can imagine each of these elements as a building block of a story that you can use to assemble a story and, and reassemble and move things around in a very intuitive way. Uh, they're, just like the maps, uh, story maps are hosted by Esri in the cloud, and all that means is that it's a convenient place to park this content. We don't claim any kind of ownership uh, to it, and you can link to it, uh, point people to it via, via social media. You can embed story maps directly in websites, etc. Um, going on uh, ten years ago, we started with uh, we we began to accumulate what we ultimately what we now call our classic apps. So we had a a series of separate apps, each of which presented a sort of different user experience. But about three years ago. Um, we started work on and launched two years ago of uh, next generation story maps called ArcGIS story maps. And we strongly urge all of you to fully embrace um, ArcGIS story maps for a variety of reasons. Uh, among them, um, this uh, mobile first design, updated design in general, but especially the fact that there's a unified single builder experience within which you can find things that roughly parallel uh, the user experiences in the classic apps. So uh, please do uh, uh, try to move to or stick to uh, ArcGIS story maps. It's been really, really exciting to see things grow. Uh, and that's been especially true in the education community. But overall, now we're actually over 1.7 million story maps hosted on, on ArcGIS online, being created and used by many, many different organizations like federal agencies and major nonprofits, uh, colleges and universities, of course. Uh, and my alma mater, National Geographic, among others. Um, and story maps have really, really gained popularity in the classroom, which is just a, a, one of our biggest thrills. Um, so roughly a third of our community is from the education realm, either educators or students. Um, we will talk more about uh, where you can go for more information. We've got loads and loads of uh, resources that you can tap. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and pass it over to Ross. Okay, so let me just say that one more time. Um, with that introduction, I'm going to show you how to get started uh, with the builder if you've never used it before, but then also show you what's new and what's cool with um, the latest updates to ArcGIS Storybooks. 
So hopefully you're seeing my screen right now. For those of you who uh, haven't used ArcGIS Story Match before, the easiest way to get started is to go to esri.com slash storymaps. Now, when you go to this URL, it'll bring up um, the product page. And this is a really helpful resource to bookmark um, because we're constantly updating it with new stories from the broader community um, that can be good examples to show in the classroom uh, and have resources by topic. Um, in addition, we have a number of blog posts um, as well as stories and instructional material for how to get started, but also to take your stories to the next level. Um, we also have advertisements uh, for things like our new, our next uh, live webinars that, that happen every other month. Um, so these are really helpful resources to uh, remember. In addition, you can get started with the builder uh, by just clicking the launch ArcGIS Story Maps button here. It will prompt you to log in um, and you're brought to this stories page. This is where you can uh, go in and edit any story that you've created or revisit stories that are in draft form or that are published. I'll also just indicate over here on the left, there are a number of helpful links as well as other tools to use. So you can go to this explore stories, get started. These are all really helpful, as well as collections and themes. Um, and I'll mention those again in a second. So again, just if you wanna get started with the bare bones, click new story, start from scratch, and it launches the builder. Um, this is kind of the authoring environment for creating a story. So you can simply start typing. And you can see it's really pretty intuitive. Now, like Alan mentioned, there's this block, uh, content block builder. So if you just click here, you get access to all of these different types of media and immersive reading experiences. That ranges from text to maps and images, uh, video, as well as uh, some of the immersive uh, content. Now we're going to be sharing a number of links that help you get started uh, from scratch. Um, so for this, we're gonna go a little bit past those beginner stages and show you the latest updates and things that we're really excited about on the Story Maps team that we think could be really helpful in the classroom. So I've created a story that's just uh, populated with some content so we can go a little deeper in the short amount of time that we have together. Um, I should also note that feel free to use the chat to type any questions you have. Um, we've got Laura and Alan standing by um, to answer those as they come up. So the first big uh, news is this timeline block. The timeline block allows you to have a simple user experience to incorporate sort of key dates or a sequence of uh, related information. This can be good for you know, outlining uh, you know, what you're gonna cover in a class setting or uh, presenting a topic that has a very uh, a temporal aspect to it. To get to the timeline block, you just click the plus button and you go down to timeline. Now you have two different style options, the waterfall or single slide, single slide. Um, I've already created one and I wanna just show you how easy it is to switch between uh, these two uh, different layouts. So again, I'm using this kind of to show the uh, chronological events, um, but again, you can use this for a variety of uh, for a variety of uses. Now, to sort of add a new section to the timeline, you just click the plus. Let's add another event. We'll put a new date. We'll say twenty twenty one. And if I want to add an image, I just go over here, and browse for a. Uh, image, 
And really quickly, I've added a new uh, event within this timeline block. And so I imagine, um, hopefully this gets the wheels turning around how this could be incorporated into either an existing lesson or an assignment for students that are maybe reporting on a historical event or um, any number of topics. Okay, the next big improvement is collections. So if you aren't familiar with collections, collections are a way to package up a number of stories that you've made all in one place. Instead of creating a massive story that maybe takes 30 minutes to read, you can break that up into chapters or maybe assignment one, assignment two, assignment three, um, and put them all in a collection. And in doing so, this will uh, make it a lot easier to uh, break up your content. So what I'm going to show you is just how to quickly make a collection. So right here, we're back to the stories page. We're going to go to collection here. And you can see these are some of the stories that I've already uh, put together. So let's just click on this example collection. Now you can see this maybe looks a little different than other collections uh, in the past. We have different cover options now. And this is in the design panel. So you can see there's three different layout options. You've got this sort of gridded layout. This is best for a large number of stories. You can see there's you know 50 stories or so in this collection. You also have this magazine layout, which is a very nice aesthetic. Um, again, it can work with a large number of stories, but um, it might be best for uh, a smaller number. And then lastly, we've got this journal layout. With the journal layout, it's more of this vertical, uh, you know, you get these small kind of windows all in a nice vertical here. And so I urge you to experiment with collections because it can be a really nice way of packaging up and organizing content for your students. In addition, you have the ability to change the navigation. So this is how you sort of advance through your various stories. And you can also change the theme of your stories really quickly. Now, if I wanna go in and customize my theme, you just click manage my themes. And you can see these are all ones that I've created. But if you wanna make a new theme, you can quickly go in and have some fun experimenting with you know, the color palette, the typography, uh, depending on your audience. This can just make your content in the classroom more engaging for your students and look a little different than your typical uh, presentation. Um, again, you know, this can be a rabbit hole. You can spend a lot of time uh, creating a custom theme, but uh, I think it can really elevate the content of your stories and uh, engage students deeper into uh, your topics themselves. Great, so if I'm back here, I can browse my themes. Let's go to this demo one I just made and boom, you can see that's how it looks. I'm gonna go back to that uh, story that we were looking at. Ooh. Oh yeah, there we go. And I wanna just show you another cool feature um, that's come out with Map Tour, with the Map Tour block. So we talked about timelines, we talked about collections. Next, I wanna show you a data-driven map tour. This is more of an advanced technique, um, but it represents how you can integrate multiple Esri apps into one uh, really compelling reading experience. So we like to use Survey123, which is another Esri tool. It's really a form-driven tool um, to engage our readers um, in storytelling activities. 
Um, one application of this is actually the crowdsource data uh, for a story. So we have this block called the map tour block. And there's this new feature called start with a feature service. What that means is you can take uh, live data and or static data and create a map tour automatically from it. Now, these are uh, submissions from a survey one, two, three. Um, and by clicking on it, it will now populate this map tour automatically. So instead of clicking one point by one point, it really uh, automates the process and can create a much uh, richer um, and faster reading experience. Again, you can always customize uh, your base map. You can even add your own base map if you want. You can change the color of your points. And you can change your layout if you want. And you do that right here. And so instead of um, sort of just a item by item list, we can use this grid option, which for a lot of points can really help uh, create a better reading experience. There are 100 points here visualized at once. And so this is a really nice way of, again, taking uh, data and visualizing it quickly without having to go individually point by point. Okay, I'm gonna move pretty quickly because we have limited time and a lot to cover, but um, the other thing that's getting us really excited is the web mapping capabilities. So, you know, there's many different ways of incorporating maps into a story. Something that's really exciting is thinking about which mapping tools can be most appropriate for which age group and learning objectives. Um, one thing that we're really excited about is uh, express maps, and especially express maps being used in the classroom, because it doesn't require a foundation in, you know, all of ArcGIS Online. Um, you don't need to know how to create a web map. It's just very intuitive user experience. And it's only getting better. So if you go to map, new express map, You can add points, lines, even text really quickly. And so we'd be really curious to see how teachers are using Express Maps in the classroom to help students build sort of that foundational knowledge around how, like points, lines, and polygons. How do we think about spaces and how do we identify them and present them? So again, you know, the assignment might be you know, make a map of, you know, add a point to where you live. So I live in Washington, DC. And okay, I just added a map. Now I'm going to add <clears throat> an image. This is not Great Falls, but <clears throat> it'll work for this example. Um, And you can even change the color of this point. Again, really quickly. Click done. And you know, you can you have a simple locator map of Washington, Washington, DC. Now you can also extend this uh, to think about other learning objectives. So maybe you're talking about the movement of people or uh, Brood X, um, you can use arrows really easily to, uh, you know, communicate concepts. Um, so again, really excited to see how you guys use uh, Express Maps in the classroom. And we'd love to see some chats on, you know, whether you're using this or not uh, to engage your students. Yeah. Okay, in addition, I wanna share um, a couple more uh, mapping options that perhaps, you know, thinking about high school aged or even higher ed um, could be really helpful. So 
Again, we go back to that map block. This time, instead of Express Maps, I'm going to go to Living Atlas. So for those of you who don't know about Living Atlas, it's Esri's cloud data repository. These are maps that have already been styled, um, but can be used in any uh, story uh, really quickly and easily. So I have a soft spot for cicadas. So I'm going to bring in this Living Atlas cicada map um, as an example of how you can quickly bring in these kind of pre-made pre uh, maps um, and perhaps build lessons around them. But you can see they have nice styled pop-ups um, and uh, they're really easy to add. Um, and you can make them smaller or larger. And lastly, you can uh, even add your own maps. Uh, so say you're in higher ed or uh, high school or even um, younger audiences who have been making uh, their own maps. Um, again, you can really quickly bring in, um, bring in maps that you've made yourself. Here's a hike um, that I did in uh, near Asheville called Shining Rock Wilderness. Um, lastly, I want to show how you can embed things like a swipe block to be able to show uh, analysis or have people see change or uh, start asking questions about sort of where and why. Um, so again, swipe block is a really powerful feature for extending um, mapping. Again. You just simply can add an image or a web map. I'll add a web map in this case. Let's go to Living Atlas, environment. We'll go to sea level trends. And I'll just put a simple um, imagery here. Three GS. Say we wanted to see sea level rise on one side and and fire trends on the other. There are so many amazing data sets out here to check out. But again, very easy to add. And with a swipe block, you can just simply see really quickly uh, compare two places at once. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Alan and he'll uh, kind of go further about what's happening in the classroom that we're observing. All right, great. Thank you, Ross. My fingers are kind of sore from uh, typing madly into the chat window, so have fun with that. <clears throat> it's great. I, we really appreciate all the all the questions, uh, most of which we can try to answer. And if we don't answer them successfully here, you can get in touch with us afterward. Uh, and uh, again, forgive me for moving quickly. You can see my screen, right? Good. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm not going to, yeah, again, I'm going to cruise by some of this stuff, but we're going to give you links to the stuff we're showing and additional resources so you can uh, take your time later on. But this is uh, just a little compilation in story map form of the things that are being done in higher education with story maps. We're going to move from higher ed to quickly to high schools and then to elementary schools. Uh, or education to uh, to show you some of the things that are going on and some of the ideas that are be, being developed. Um, at any rate, um, this is a, a story or just a screen grab from a story by uh, Laura McGrath at Temple University, uh, who provided one example, which is a little bit unusual and kind of cool, which is putting a syllabus into a story map. So she's created a nicely organized story map for her course uh, that goes week by week and and has the reading list for for each week. A much more common use and one that we're really thrilled to see is, is for collection pages to be used to aggregate the stories that a class uh, uh, has been assigned. So this is a, uh, a class at, I believe, UC Davis 
oh, it's a GIS class, but of course it doesn't have to be a GIS class. We're seeing things like this for humanities courses and all sorts of things at any rate, but it, students were assigned individually uh, to do stories related to um, uh, sustainable development goal topics. And I'm just gonna show, uh, show the live version real quick because this is kind of the heart and soul of what really excites us. So story maps obviously can be used for instructional purposes, but it's when students are, uh, are creating their own stories as alternatives to, uh, to, to traditional and static research papers that it gets really excited. So just choosing at random, this is a student produced stories, story on how to, uh, what can be done to essentially repurpose abandoned golf courses in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, so uh, this is easy to do if all the students in the class are within one organization or one group. It's a little more challenging if they, they, they're, they're in different organizations, but it can still, this kind of thing can still be done. But of course, most colleges and universities have their own, uh, their own accounts uh, with, with all these organizational capabilities. <clears throat> Story maps, of course, are also being used for scholarly research and publications, uh, and I won't go into detail on this one, but this is very, uh, goes into beautiful detail, uh, not <clears throat> about the topic, and then within each sub subtopic, it has a list of uh, essentially embed cards um, that, that'll, that allow access to other scholarly uh, publications. Uh, field research, similarly, uh, this is a beautiful story, academic, but beautiful story on uh, on archaeological work in the in the Middle East, with uh, with very detailed mapping in 2D and 3D, um, lots and lots of things are happening within libraries, of course, at colleges and universities. Um, this wonderful phenomenon of GIS librarians are essentially a, a, a central place in university libraries that can serve their whole their their campuses, and we're doing some research on that with our with my friend Dave Cowan uh, and Angie Lee of of Esri's education team. Uh, but the Harvard Uni University Library map, li map collection is one example of stories that they've produced themselves. And of course, in addition, they're performing this service role across, the, across their uh, campuses. Um, another kind of cool <coughs> innovation is to use a collection in a different way, which is essentially to, uh, to have little, ask students to create a little bio of themselves or summarize their project just in an informal way and aggregate those stories into, into a collection. Um, there, it, toward the end of the story are links to some additional resources, uh, but you can access those later. Um, I just wanted to quickly show uh, one of the winners at uh, last year's uh, Storytelling with Maps competition, which was centered around the Sustainable Development Goals and done in partnership with the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, um, just to celebrate the, how, how beautiful uh, and sophisticated stories can be, even if they're created by students. So this, this person did a wonderful job of creating uh, graphics, superimposing them on, on drone footage, uh, creating a really nice <clears throat> immersive look and feel with, uh, with, with graphics she probably produced on desktop uh, graphics software, but incorporating uh, all sorts of graphs and charts. Uh, this is an immersive section. Uh, she's created uh, static maps as well as dynamic maps, uh, highlighting some of the pollution um, issues along the uh, Tennessee River. Uh, so just, just really beautiful work. And of course, students, being digital natives pick this sort of thing up very, very quickly and naturally and are, uh, require really very, usually very little instruction on how to use the builder itself. They just kind of uh, drop in, figure things out and are, and are off and running. I wanted to give a quick plug uh, before I turn things over again to Ross uh, for this year's Story Map competition or we're calling it a Story Maps Challenge this year on an oceans theme, we're doing this in partnership with National Geographic. We've just announced the, uh, the challenge. It will launch in, in August. So this is something you, could, uh, uh, you can let your students uh, know about. And uh, we, there, there are a couple of different categories. Uh, there's a student and a sort of young adult category, but more detail can be found on, on, this, uh, on this page. So with that uh, kind of rushed, Spiel, I'm going to stop my share and uh, turn it back to Ross. Excellent, and I'll be sure to unmute myself this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, great, so I want to talk a little bit about um, how 
we've been observing some innovative uses of story maps for uh, nine to 12th year, uh, grade groups, as well as uh, K through eighth grade. Um, so starting out with nine to 12th uh, grade, so uh, high school age students, um, you know, really uh, Jason Smolinski at uh, the Fairfax High School has been uh, doing some really innovative things, growing a geospatial semester program with Catherine Kiernan and others. Um, I'm not sure if you're on the call right now, but uh, love the work you guys are doing. Um, and this is a story that he created that just walks through sort of his journey to starting this program and how it's expanded. Um, and so he's doing anything from uh, you know, introductory mapping to actually uh, doing analysis with uh, Esri's uh, cloud mapping tools. So using ArcGIS Online and having students go from, you know, raw data to analyzing that data to then visually visualizing it and telling a story with it. Um, to a lot of success, I think students have been very, uh, you know, the projects they're working on are very relevant, very uh, real time. Um, we're always seeing innovative student projects that really push the envelope um, in terms of the capabilities of both ArcGIS story maps as well as some of Esri's cloud mapping tools. And these students are, you know, well equipped to go into uh, college with a core you know, knowledge of these tools to then take it into that, those higher ed examples that um, like Alan was just showing. Um, so it's really exciting to see uh, these taking off in uh, high school age groups. Again, there's this uh, fine balance between, you know, going so deep into the tools that I, uh, you know, students might get frustrated with ArcGIS Online, but you know, always knowing that story maps are the tool to present information, whether it's, you know, uh, geospatial uh, analysis that happens, or if it's even like the humanities. You know, a secret we don't like to say very often is that you can make a story map without any maps in it, but it's a great way of communicating information really quickly, and students uh, pick it up really quickly. Um, you know, Catherine Kiernan often says, you know, I don't have to give any instruction. I just show them how to get started and they're off to the races. So um, particularly with virtual and remote training, um, this has been uh, really successful. Um, and our team's been listening to this, you know, growing need in higher, uh, in the high school, as well as K, uh, K-8. And we have some exciting things coming um, that aren't quite ready yet, but um, you can expect them uh, very soon in the next in the coming months. So first, there's going to be an educator, which will be a collection of ready to use curated content um, later this summer. In addition, there's going to be a, a MOOC that's created. Uh, on story maps for educators um, should be coming by the end of this year. So stay tuned for those great resources. Next, I want to talk a little bit about uh, K-8 and the potential we see for engaging even younger audiences with ArcGIS story maps. Um, Laura, in particular, has been uh, spearheading this effort and thinking about how could we create uh, pre-formatted templates for, for teachers um, that provide a starting point for engaging uh, younger audiences as well as older audiences. Um, what I think was really innovative here is, you know, we often think of story maps as this tool for, you know, older students, but um, we can really adapt it here for a younger audience. Um, and so we're innovating with how to come up with a, a structure for a story that's geared towards the learning objectives and curriculum of K-8. Um, something that Laura did, and I don't know if you'll be able to hear this. Do you have a teddy bear? 
Have you seen a grizzly bear at a zoo? If you can't hear that, um, Laura is reading the text here. And so, you know, in addition to K-8, these stories can be really great for people um, with learning disabilities or at different meeting levels. And so in doing so, it extends the audience and creates, you know, educational content that serves a more, uh, a larger audience than uh, we typically see, uh, you know, groups like ours paying attention to. So really want to expand the number of audiences um, and we can bring in things like maps um, that start to engage people, you know, before that, you know, uh, social studies or geography course in high school, um, they can really get exposed to uh, these concepts a lot at a younger age through things like um, story maps. Um, so we're excited to continue to explore these concepts. Um, would love to see in the chat whether you think this is a this would be a helpful. Uh, it would be helpful to have more resources like this for K-8 and your colleagues that perhaps you interact with. Um, we're also curious, you know, would you be interested in pre-formatted stories that teachers could copy and customize um, and use in your classroom and adapt? Um, you know, there's also, you're probably familiar with the Geo Inquiries uh, project and We've been thinking about how to convert those from PDF format to um, an interactive format like this. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen and we want to make sure that we answer the questions you guys have. And so uh, I'll stop sharing and happy to take questions. Feel free to type them into the chat and um, and would love to uh, help, you know, target the rest of our time to, uh, to make it useful for you guys. Hopefully you found what we've done so far useful. Um, you might've noticed that Laura shared a um, document um, that has a series of links, including some of the stories we presented here today. Um, so, there was a question, will there be a more detailed training at a later date? Um, thanks for that question. There's a couple different ways to engage um, with training. So, you know, there's the Learn ArcGIS Hub site. That's a great resource, has a lot of um, training material there. Um, we also have an event coming up uh, on Thursday this week called Story Maps Live. Story Maps Live is where we have a featured storyteller who uh, presents how they're using ArcGIS Story Maps. Um, and we give a brief demo of the latest features that have come to ArcGIS Story Maps um, and go from there. So uh, we'll put the link to that. I can get that link while somebody else uh, answers some questions. Any other questions people have? One of the many things we're interested in doing for the uh, education community is uh, that we've been talking about, but haven't really accomplished yet very much, is to do instructional stories. So uh, some of you might be familiar with geo inquiries, for instance. Um, we've done a little bit of experimentation on doing uh, doing something, exercises like those targeted at specific grades and curriculum items in the curriculum, et cetera, uh, but in the form of a, of, of a story map that might have a survey uh, uh, using our Survey123 app embedded within it. So uh, I'd love to hear from you if there's, if there's interest in that you think, or if you think there's potential in, in that area. Okay. I guess I'm seeing a couple of yeses. <laughs> <laughs> uh, looks like here's a question. For college classes, how do you upload maps from special collections in story maps? 
Okay, so <clears throat> it depends on whether your map is static, like in an image, or whether it's an interactive map. And so if it's an interactive map that's hosted on Esri's uh, you know, ArcGIS Online, you can simply just click that map block and, and locate it from there. If it's a static map, I you can add it directly in as an image, um, This that, just using the image uh, block. Now, a sort of hybrid approach, which we've started experimenting with, is actually to take historical images and georeference those in a web map. And then you can bring that in to a story and use something like the swipe block to see change over time, for instance, if it's a historical map. Or um, you can actually you know, use map choreography and some of the other functionalities when it's in that web map. Hopefully that helps. Okay, is there a site where teachers can share resources and search resources and pre-made lessons by topic, state standards, content area, and grade? If not, this would be great to develop. Um, completely agree, this would be a really helpful uh, resource and there are a couple of things that we've included in that, in this, in, let's see, so there's the hub site that Laura shared. Um, and then there's also um, National Geographic Society, their education group is doing amazing things and they're starting to use uh, story maps more and more. And so uh, there's a link in that document to their uh, educator resources page. And most of that is uh, leveled for different uh, age groups. So I would definitely check that out. And Ross, can I jump in here for a second, please? Um, just to clarify, the, the hub site is the educator content gallery. Um, it's not quite ready for release yet. We are planning on having people use that as a supplement to their, their lessons. Um, the, the stories that it's primarily story map resources that will be included in there. And um, the long-term plan is to make it available for teachers to submit content that they want to use as well. The, the, the beta seed content will be uh, stories created by Esri story maps team or other Esri employees. And I have matched them up with mostly science or or geography standards, and they'll be tagged as such and with grade, grade levels associated with them. However, um, the reading levels are not an exact match. So you'll have to use your professional judgment when choosing the content. And as mentioned, I'm not exactly sure when that will be released to the public, but uh, the the newsletter for the education team should have that resource available when it's ready to be released publicly. I would also give a shout out to Esri Press. They've been uh, putting out some really exciting story content, but also great books for different uh, age groups. Um, I see a question from Deb. If a university student has never made uh, has never been on Esri and I sign a story map, what is the reasonable amount of time to allow for the learning curve plus prep and completion of the assignment? Great question, Deb. And of course, you probably already know, it depends on the scope of the, the assignment and the project itself. Now, story maps itself, uh, the learning curve is, isn't super steep. Um, you can get started really quickly. I think where there's some frustration or where things start taking longer is if you don't plan out your story beforehand or think about your audience and the various components of your story beforehand. So, you know, how will your, how will you, you know, how will you assemble your story? What will the narrative be? What, what's the story you want to tell before you get into the tool? 
the tool itself is pretty easy to, to use if you have your media and your maps and your text already created. Yeah, uh, Megan Dixon in the chat window had a nice response. She said, I would advise about two weeks at least if students can write good texts and compose a PowerPoint, they can do a nice story map. Allowing time for editing and verification of good citations is important. Those are those are great points. So yeah, yeah I think that two weeks is more about being uh, a kind of conscientious in more uh, in you know in terms of scholarship and communication skills than than about the the, the mechanics of uh, building the story itself. Yeah, these are great great questions. I think, I think, I think we might be out of time. Going to the end of our time, but. It's so exciting to uh, to see all your messages and really the work you guys are doing is so inspiring to us all. So if you have more feedback for the product or uh, you know have resources you wanna share, um, we're very active on Twitter, RQIS Story Maps, um, but also feel free to get in touch. Um, yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a, a pleasure and an honor to join you today. Uh, looking forward to seeing most of you in person next year. Thanks so much.